Would you look with me now in Luke 19 and verse 11? <clears throat> As they heard these things, now that means they had heard Jesus say, uh, I have come to seek and to save the lost. They had heard Jesus interacting with Zacchaeus in his conversion. As they heard these things, he, Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable for two reasons. He's about to tell this parable. One, because he was near to Jerusalem. Two, because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman, a, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas. And he said to them, do business, engage in business. Engage in business, do business until I come. But his citizens hated him and, and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business, what they had gained, profited by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good and faithful sir. Well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here's your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief for I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. The grass withers, the flower fades, God's Word, which abides forever, uh, is now, by God's grace, to be preached for you. Please be seated. <clears throat> so, can I, um, do y'all mind, a, please allow me a pastoral moment right here? If you're new to Briarwood or visiting at Briarwood, um, one of the things that we're committed to doing is what we call expository preaching. And that is the uh, working through passages of Scripture, books of the Bible normally. Last year we did First Peter. This coming year we're going to be doing the book of Romans. Um, but we also do another form of expository preaching, and that is topical expository preaching. And January of every year is an occasion for it. What we do in January is unfold the ministry theme that our church is focusing upon this coming year, uh, throughout the year, and this year it is lifestyle Christian stewardship. And so we're focused upon that. So what I like to do is, is between the first of the year and our missions conference is to bring about five or six messages that lay out for us that theme, at least the foundations of it from various texts of Scripture. And that's what we've done. Uh, today will be the last one I do on these passages that's laying out the foundation of lifestyle stewardship for the Christian. Uh, we are then going to, after missions conference, begin to drill down in understanding stewardship, and then we'll move into the book of Romans. But, uh, but this is the last one on the foundational issues of stewardship, lifestyle 
stewardship. Now, what we did first of all, remember, is we went to that key text in 1 Corinthians 4 in which the Apostle Paul gives us the essential objective of stewardship. He says, it is required of a steward to be found trustworthy or to be found faithful. That's, what, that's the basic requirement of a steward. We then decided, let's take a look at stewardship in real life. So from Genesis 39, we studied perhaps other than our Savior, the most preeminent steward in all of the Bible, and that is Joseph. A man that was a steward for his father Jacob, a man that was a steward as a slave in Potiphar's house, a man that was a steward as a prisoner uh, in, for the prison uh, um, warden, the prison keeper, and then a man who was a steward in the palace of Pharaoh for Pharaoh himself, second only to Pharaoh over all of Egypt. So here is a man who is a steward that we learned from to take a look at stewardship in real time in his life. And uh, so that's what we did out of his life. Then we said, now let's go take a look at what the steward of all stewards. Has there ever been a steward like our Savior who was given a business to do for the Father? Go save my people. And he did business. He took care of business. Father, all whom you've given me, I lose not one, but raise them up on the last day. And so this Jesus teaches us about stewardship in the kingdom. There are two key parables that he uses, and they sound very much alike. The parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 24, and then the, um, chapter 25, and then the parable of the... Uh, of the menias that I just read that we studied last week and this week. And therein, in these two, they're not the same now, they're different. And you say, well, Harry, how are they different? I am so glad you're interested in that. Next fall, I'm going to preach on the parable of the talents, next fall. So you'll be right here and I'll preach for it then and I'll answer your question how it's different from the parable of the ten menias. It has some overlap, but it is different. But the parable of the ten menias, uh, we began to unfold last week. And can I just stop here pastorally and personally say, I have had a great time this week. Uh, it's really interesting, all the feedback, all the questions, all the comments about, you know, pastor, I never really, that, that was so helpful. And it's just been wonderful to talk about this parable with so many of you by phone, by email, uh, text, uh, I don't know whatever else is, we, uh, they, we still do phones, I think. We did that too. But so we were able to communicate and, and just conversationally all week. And I've had a lot of fun, but I'm back to it, not because we had a lot of conversation with it. I'm back to it because last week I left two things on the table from this parable that we did not mention that will allow us to, to lay out the foundation for lifestyle stewardship. That's why I'm coming back to it today. Now, you remember the parable. It begins with a nobleman, an heir apparent of the kingdom. He arrives to establish the kingdom, but he will leave and come back to receive the kingdom. <clears throat> and when he leaves, he pulls his disciples together. Now, don't forget why Jesus is teaching this. They're nearing Jerusalem. In other words, beginning in Luke 9 through Luke 19, this passage, Jesus has been on a journey from the Galilee to Jerusalem where he will suffer and die for our sins. He's now nearing Jerusalem. Because he's nearing Jerusalem where he will then do his redeeming work for us, and it is there that he will establish the kingdom. Now, remember, this is why when Jesus began his ministry, he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It, the kingdom of God is not in its fulfilled state, but it is in its initial state. Why? Because the king, if the king's there, then the kingdom is there. And so he has come to establish it, and at the cross he will defeat all of his enemies. Then he will go away, and when he comes back, he'll destroy the enemies that he defeated 
when he came the first time. And when he comes back, he will receive the kingdom. Now what, and, and so he's, he's, he's letting them understand about this kingdom because most of them wanted the kingdom immediately. Most of them wanted a political, military, economic juggernaut kingdom. He said, no, no, this is a spiritual kingdom. I'm establishing it now. When I come back, I'll receive it. And while I'm gone, all of those who belong to me, my servants, my disciples, I want you to do business. And to communicate this, he takes his servants and his disciples, 10 of them. Now, that's not, that doesn't mean he only has 10 servants and disciples. 10 is a number of completion, like 10 commandments. It is a number of completion. It represents all of his servants and disciples whom he redeems at the cross, whom he receives to himself, and whom he will receive into glory and lose none of them. So he takes this 10, and he then takes 10 minas, and he gives one to each of them. And then he says to them, do business. Take care of business. Engage in business. And he then tells them to be stewards of his, taking care of business with what he has given them to do business. Each one a mina. Then he returns. We don't know when this king is coming back, but in the parable, he returns. We don't know how long, was it, how long it was. It was an unspecified day. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. It's unspecified. No man knows the hour or time. We do know what we're now, we're learning what we're supposed to do in between that time. And as he comes, but in the parable, he comes back. And when he comes back, there were two groups of people while he was gone. Those who said, we will not have this king to rule over us. And then his servant disciples. And when he comes back, that brings accountability. That brings judgment. And so when he has a judgment, there are two aspects of this judgment. One is for those who would not have him rule over them. That is a lethal, eternal judgment, and the destination is hell, Gehenna, the lake of fire. The other judgment is for those whom he has already taken that judgment. Those who he brings to judgment for eternal uh, condemnation are those who are in the books and they're judged. But God's people, his servants, aren't in those books. They're in the book of life. And they're in the book of life because Jesus, when he went to the cross, took all of their sins upon himself and removed their guilt and shame. There is therefore now no condemnation. But they still appear before the judgment seat. Remember what Paul says? We must all appear before the judgment seat. But they appear not for the issue of eternity, but for the issue of their stewardship. How did they do? Now, all 10 are not um, in the narrative. Only three of them are. And one of them took one mina and said, look, one mina, 10 minas, and the king says, 10 cities. You've been faithful in little. Here's much. Another one says, here's my mina, five minas. He says, five cities. You're faithful in little. Here is the reward of much. And then comes one who said, who, who says, look, um, I, I still got it. Wait a minute, hold it. I've, I, I wasn't a steward, I was a hoarder. I hoarded it. Here, let me unfold my, here it is. You see, I didn't, I, I was very careful because I knew you're a severe man. This king has strict standards. So I hoarded it. And then he says, well, you're condemned with your own words. Your hoarding shows that you think you owned it. If you thought I was a severe man, then why didn't you go invest it for me? And at least I would have had its return when I came back. No, your own words have condemned you. And then you find out something else. He doesn't know the king. 
like you and I can know the king. We know a king who when he came to establish the kingdom, he died on a hill to save us. And we know a king that when he returns to receive the kingdom, his blessing upon his stewards far exceeds the results of their stewardship. One mina, 10 minas, okay, 1,000%, pretty good. 10 cities, there is a disproportionate reward. It's clear this man does not know this king. You're faithful in little, look what I give you, much. And you see not only his graciousness when he comes to save us, but when his graciousness when he comes to receive us, as our rewards are far disproportionate to the results of our stewardship. But what we do find out is his servants do business while he's gone. That's what we find out. Harry, what did you leave on the table last week? Two things. This parable teaches you, number one, of the two things. Stewardship for those who know Christ is not an option. It's an assignment. Lifestyle stewardship is not an option. Most of us, now let's, let, let's, let's be honest, most of us think I'm saved by grace. Now, stewardship, you know, that's something some Christians do really well. Some Christians don't do so well. And, you know, I, 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 I may put, I, I'll think about that later. If you understand what this is saying, how many, what represents all of his servants? Ten. How many got minas? Ten. How many were told to go do business? All ten. Every one of his servants it receives resources from him, and they're told, go do business. Do the business of the kingdom with the resources the king has given you till you return. Secondly, stewardship is comprehensive. Stewardship is comprehensive, not selective, not minimum. Not, it's not the bare minimum. It is something that is a full, here is the, here, what did you allocate me? Amina, what did I do with it? I invested, I did business with the whole Mina. What's the result? 10. What's the result? Five. In, that, in other words, it was a full engagement to do business for the king in his work. So let me just walk with you through this, and then we've got our foundation laid when we come back after the missions conference. Let's start, let's go with this first piece of it. Lifestyle Christian stewardship. Let's just take the word stewardship with what we've learned thus far. Number, here's what we have learned. We learned five things about stewardship. Well, the first thing we learned was the name, didn't we? Oika nomas. Oika house. Nomas rules. Oika nomia. Oika nomas. Oika nomia. House rules. Oika nomia. We tra translated rules of the house transliterated economy, oikonomia. It is a way of life, the economy of life as a Christian. So here we are in stewardship, economy, a way of life, and the first thing we learn is this, the steward owns nothing. Now, folks, this is crucial. You'll never get to Christian stewardship until we get to this first element, Stewards own nothing. I know it says on the title, you own your house. But as a Christian, you know I don't. I don't. I, th I know it says you got the title to your car. And you know I do not. The Lord does. Stewards own nothing. Secondly, the master in stewardship, the master owns everything. Thirdly, the master allocates what each steward is to have and instructs us on where and how to do business. 
and then instructs us on where and how to do business. Then number four, the steward is accountable to the master. The steward will be accountable to the master for what was allocated to him and the fulfillment of the instructions. Number five, the steward's objective and desire in the day of accountability, that day of judgment of stewardship is three things. I want to be faithful, I want to be focused, and I want to be productive. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. This, I, this is not a political speech. And, um, but with, uh, as I read this text, G, uh, God's a capitalist. And I'm convinced he's a capitalist. Let me, let me just ask you, go back here. What did, what, did he give his, what did he give them? What did the king give them? He gave them capital. And then what did he say to, what, did, what does it say? He says this, he says, Lord, your mina has made productive 10 minas more. Go back to the previous verse. He ordered these servants to whom, in verse, um, go back to verse 15. He ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had, what? Gained. He expects them to take what he has given and be faithful, be focused, and then be productive in what he has given. And so that's what he calls us to be as good stewards. He calls us to be faithful, focused, and, um, and to be productive. I guess some of you are sitting here today and you're wondering, you know, I get the, I get the sense each Lord's Day that the worship service the confession, the scripture, the sermon, the songs, everything is kind of aimed at a thematic focus each Lord's Day of some sense. And you're right. And you're probably sitting there today, now why did we do Genesis 1, 26 through 29? There's a reason. <laughs> In creation, God made you to be a steward. You were created to be a steward. God made man in his image, male and female. And then God said to them, this place I've built for you, fill it up. Be fruitful and multiply. Secondly, have dominion over it. Rule over it in my name. You are a steward that I have appointed over the house I made for you to live in. It's called the earth. And then what did he say? Have, he says, subdue it and have dominion over it. Rule and reign over it. Keep it, subdue it, tend it, defend it, and fill it. I made you as my stewards in my image. That's what God did for us. And by the way, you see this running throughout the scripture. You see Elijah, you see not only Joseph, let me give you another one, Elijah. He then mentored who? Elisha. And then what did Elisha want? Let me have your mantle. I want to be a steward of this prophecy that the ministry of the prophets, and let me have a double portion of your spirit that I might be faithful. I could do this time and time again throughout Scripture. God created us to be stewards. Have, have y'all, has anybody been listening to discussions on climate change? Anybody been hearing that? Um, it's, it's really interesting. And I don't know about you, but when I hear all these discussions, I've got this Oh, boy, this sounds good. And then I got this, oh, man, I don't want any part of that. Now, let me tell you my problem. I don't want any part of it because it's always couched in some form of pantheism. Like my mother earth. This earth is not my mother. And time is not my father. But I'll tell you what this earth is. It's my home. And my daddy and mama taught me to take care of your home. 
And God made us to take care of the home. Subdue it. Keep it. Fill it. He's to have dominion over it. And that, that's what we're called to do. We're called to be stewards of the creation. And we're called to be stewards of our redemption. That's why Paul keeps saying, this is the stewardship that's been given to me. The stewardship of our charge. Time and time again, they use that phrase, we are stewards. Elders, in, the, in, first, in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, you're called stewards over Christ's church. Stewardship is built throughout all of the scriptures and all of our redemption. So we're not only stewards, uh, and not only is stewardship a biblical concept, we were created to be stewards, we are redeemed to be stewards. Well, what kind of stewards? We've got Christian stewardship. We are not our own. We own nothing because we're owned in Christian stewardship. The Lord owns us. Our master is Jesus, not just any master, it's Jesus. Jesus has allocated to us the resources of, for the issues of life whereby we are to do business for the Lord. We're to take care of business. When I was first married, um, I guess I just thought I was, I had, to, I had to get a bunch of jobs. I had married this woman that was really high maintenance. and. Uh, so I got three jobs, and one of them, I, just, I, got a, I sold life insurance. My daddy did, my granddaddy did, so I figured I ought to. And so I went to work for Life and Casualty of Tennessee, and my granddaddy's brother, my uncle, my uncle Lonnie called me over, and he said, all right, bring your stuff and talk to me about a policy. I'll have, I'll have Aunt Mary, your aunt there. I said, okay, so I went over. I stumbled and fumbled and mumbled and all of this, and finally, after a while, he stopped, and he said, you know, he said, uh, Harry, he said, you know, I really love you. He said, and I love you, Daddy, and I love you, Mama. I love you, three sisters. Did I tell you I love you? I love you. I love you, Granddaddy, my brother. He said, but this is the worst exhibition of business I've ever seen in my life. He said, son, if you're going to do business, then take care of business. That has stuck with me the rest of my life. And if we're going to do business for Jesus, then let's take care of business. Well done, good and faithful servant as a steward for the Lord. So we own nothing. We're owned. Our master owns everything, including us. He's allocated. Where does he instruct us how to deal with what he's allocated? In his word. That's why we go to his word. Are we accountable to him? Yes, at the judgment day. What do we want to hear on that day? Well done, good and faithful servant. We want to be faithful, focused, and we want to be productive. We want to have taken what he's given to us, and we want to have made an impact in the kingdom by his grace and for his glory. We don't want to waste the resources or our time that Jesus has entrusted to us. And that means we want to do Christian stewardship and that Christian stewardship is that he saved us to be stewards. We're not, listen, folks, we're not stewards to be saved. He saved us to be stewards. We're stewards because we love our Savior who saved us. That's not all we are. When Jesus saved you, he has given you multiple vocations, multiple calling. You're a discipler. You're an evangelist. You're an ambassador. You're a worshiper. You are a, um, uh, uh, you're a saint. You are, God has made multiple callings in your life. One of those, a crucial one, is he has called you. Every one of us, the master has allocated resources, instructed us with his word, and he says to us, take care of business for the king until the king returns. And that Christian steward, that stewardship is not only Christian stewardship, we do it because we loved him, 
It is a stewardship that's permeated by Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. I not only own nothing, I don't even own my life. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and who gave himself for me. And this is a lifestyle of Christian stewardship. Do you know why everywhere Joseph went, he was made a steward? Jacob made him a steward and gave him a robe to affirm it. Potiphar made him a steward. A prison warden made him a steward. A pharaoh made him a steward. The reason why Joseph was made a steward everywhere he went is because that's the way Joseph lived, as a steward of the living God. He was given assignments for stewardship because his life was given to the Lord as stewardship. And therefore, that meant all of life, his relationships. And this is where I look forward to drilling down with you, his relationships. I have a relationship with Cindy. I've got to be a good steward of that. I've got to be a good steward of that. You know, I, I still can't amaze. She said, yes, she did. Now you're stuck. 51 years stuck. But I remember when we were first converted. I mean, I was first married. <laughs> I was converted not long after that, right? So I remember, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and looking at my wife <laughs> there in the bed and thinking, oh my, this is for life. This is not the big date. This is life. Now, don't, I know you ladies are sitting there getting all huffy with me right now. I know you are. But just go talk to her. She woke up in the middle of the night and looked at me. I've never asked her, what did you think when you looked at me? I'm afraid to ask that. I wake up more at night now than I used to. And I look. I used to think, the rest of my life, I now think how little of my life I've got left to live with her. But it's a life to steward a relationship. It's a life. I've got three kids. I parented them. They're up and gone. And I'm still parenting them. Not really, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I've got, my, I've got my kids. Now I've got grandkids. I have the extraordinary privilege of relationships all over this congregation. I'm just a pastoral relationship. I have relationships with the elders and deacons. I've got relationships in a presbytery. I've got relationships in my denomination. I've got relationships all over the place. And they're all tied usually to my responsibilities. I'm responsible as a husband. God's outlined me what I'm supposed to do as a husband. He's outlined what I'm supposed to do in my responsibility as a father. He's outlined what I'm supposed to do as a pastor. And then not only has, do I have responsibilities and relationships and they're entwined, but then he's given me resources through which to accomplish those responsibilities and relationships in my stewardship. He's given me time. And there's something we've all got the same amount of, right? How many, how many hours do you have in a day? Guess what? We all got it. How many days in a week? Seven. And you were born into this world, God having ordained a finite number of sunsets and sunrises. There's coming a day somewhere I'm getting out of bed and I won't come back to it. We have a finite number. Before I was born, my days were numbered. Now, every day I spend it. How do I spend it? 24 hours I spend it. 
To get two sermons to you every day, that's a responsibility and a relationship as a pastor to minister the primary means of grace, the preaching of God's Word, knowing that it's through the foolishness of preaching that men or women are being saved. He has given me time to do that. It takes about two sermons. It takes about 36, 38 hours. Now, where do I find it? How do I deal with it? Where do I get it? But once I've done it, I don't get that back. $10, I can get it back. I don't get that back. So know your responsibilities. Know your relationships. Know your resources. You've got time. You've got talents. You've got physical talents. You've got spiritual talents. You've got, um, you've got finances. You've got all of those things that you then use in the context of your responsibilities and your relationships. And it's God's Word that guides you. It's God's Word that gives you your commitments. I've vowed. I've got responsibilities. I took vows as a minister. I took vows as a member. I took vows in baptism. I took vows in a marriage. I took vows in, a, in, a, in my commitment to do a job. I take vows in a court. I take vows, and now that's a stewardship that's given to me. And the same thing is true of you that's true of me. So we have these responsibilities, these relationships, and in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all of that, guess what else? We've got experiences, blessings, adversity, difficulty, sickness, failure, opposition, and you're supposed to be a steward of that. Do you know why Joseph is such a good steward? He not only was a steward over a beautiful coat that was given to him, he was a steward over the slavery that was imposed to him. He was a steward over a false, uh, here's a man who had a kangaroo court, false charges, and then he got put in jail. What did he do when he first came into jail? He didn't go die in a pile. He was a steward of two prisoners and began to minister to them. And then he, he got one of them that he interpreted their dreams. God gave him a talent to interpret divine revelation through a dream. And the one that was supposed to remember him when he got out did what? He forgot him. He didn't go die in a pile. He kept being a good steward, so much so that the, the prison guard put him over and made him the trustee of the entire prison. Then he gets to the palace. He was a trustee over being, he was a trustee in the pit. He was trustworthy as a steward in the pit. That's why he got to the palace. He was trustworthy as a slave in Potiphar's house, and then God put him in a palace. He was a, he was a steward over adversity, over traitors, over everything. He stewarded all of his life, and my goodness, if he did it, how much more do you see our Savior as a steward in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's betrayed? As a steward, when he is lashed to the point of the loss of his life, as a steward at the cross as he takes our sins upon himself to save us from our sins. A steward is a steward in all of life and with your very life. So here's the takeaway, and then I'll close in prayer. Lifestyle Christian stewardship is not an option. It is a divine calling. It is a divine assignment. It is a divine opportunity. It's not drudgery. It's an exciting journey. It's not selective. You don't minimize. Well, hey, I'm a good steward. I give the tithe. The other 90% is mine. You missed the message. I give the Lord the Lord's day. The other six are mine. You missed the message. I give my marriage to the Lord, but everything else is mine. You missed the message. God has given us multiple callings in the Christian life, but stewardship is a divine assignment. It is not optional. It is a divine calling that is exciting. It isn't drudgery. It is a journey of excitement to see what God does as you steward tough moments 
as an elder named Jim Elliott stewarded the moment in the death of a 39-year-old wife facing raising four children and the way he addressed it with grief that was informed by God's word converted a young man that was watching him whose life was converted and changed and that was mine. And so that stewardship goes on and on and on. And then in God's providence, 15 years later, I circle back around and I get the opportunity to minister to those four daughters and their glorious Christian life. Do you not see? That's why Piper writes the book, Don't Waste Your, Ca your Cancer, Steward It. That you, are, you and I are called to a stewardship ministry in which we, let me, can I just ask you this? I'm gonna, then I'm gonna close in prayer. I wanna ask you, do you own nothing? Judgment day honesty. You're gonna have to one day give judgment day honesty. Do you own nothing? Does Christ own everything? Do you go to his word to find out how to do business? Do you long for the generosity of not only his redeeming work when he came the first time, but his magnificent, astonishing generosity when he comes again? Well done, good and faithful servant. Steward it. Uh, there's so many illustrations. Can I just give you one? 16 years ago, our at the time, we weren't doing Bridge to Life. We were doing Evangelism Explosion. And Dan Allison was training. And they went out to do visitation. And they stewarded the names that were given to them. And then they ran out. And they ran out of, started running out of everything. <laughs> but they were out, and they knew the gospel. This is a moment. Let's steward it. So they went to an apartment, knocked on the door. Hi. Can we ask you some questions? We're from Briarwood Presbyterian Church. We'd like to do a survey. The guy's standing there with a beer. Language that I can't repeat at the pulpit. <laughs> yeah, come on in. Another guy is in there also with his beer. And they brought him in. And they began to talk. And finally, they, after three or four questions, said, may we ask you two more questions? If you were to die tonight, do you know where you would spend eternity. The one man with frivolity and blasphemy, but the other man was quiet. And he said, yes, I do, and I don't want to be there. Can you tell me how to get to heaven? And they led him to Christ. Then they noticed they weren't alone. They could sense somebody was listening. As the bedroom door cracked open, a young lady walked out and she said, God sent you here. I've run away from my daddy and mama. I went to a bar to get picked up and I was tonight. And I was brought back here and I knew what was going to happen. Then you knocked on the door. Can I pray with you, give my life to Jesus and go home? A steward. Well, we ran out of stuff. Nah, we're a steward. Well, we ran out of name. Nah, we're a steward. Stewarding in crisis and adversity and challenges, all of life. I want to do business for Jesus. And I want to be a steward in and of his kingdom because the king saved me. And it is astonishing what we will do when he comes back. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's spend a few moments in prayer. May I just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and my heart while you're praying. Holy Spirit, you do your work now, please. I ask it.
you want to pray with someone afterwards, there'll be folks up here to pray with. Lord, help us be good stewards of the gospel. Help us to be good stewards of relationships. Help us to be good stewards of responsibilities. Help us to steward the resources of time and talents and treasures. Give us joy, even to be good stewards over challenges, failures, adversity, sickness. Lord, we even want to be a good steward over our death. Whether by life or death, we want to exalt Christ. So give us full-orbed life of stewardship that exalts Christ. Christian stewardship. No responsibility hoarded. No relationship hoarded put into a handkerchief. No resources hoarded, but all used, instructed by your word, led by your spirit to advance the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you